All right. <clears throat> Hello all. Um, welcome to migrating the AWS Lambda functions to an open source serverless solution on OpenFAS. Um, I am Burton Rutan. I'm currently a principal engineer at Dell Technologies. I was until recently um, one of the members of the OpenFAS core team. Uh, I've since, since stepped down uh, as the work at uh, my main job has taken a lot of my time and I haven't been able to contribute as much as I would like to, so I've stepped down for the time being. But I'm still a uh, part of the project. Um, I was once a BMW certified technician and um, spent some time in the US Navy. Had a very mechanical background, but now I am in the software world and in the open source as much as I possibly can. Uh, so quickly, just set some expectations for this talk. Um, this, what it is, what it is, what it is not, what it is, and what you, what I hope you can get out of this. Uh, so first, this is not a bash on AWS Lambda in any way. AWS is one of the main leaders in the cloud computing world. They have a lot of open source projects, lots of contributions. Uh, there's no knock on them at all. Also, this is not um, intended to sell you open as as a solution to your problems. Uh, it, you may find that it will help, but this is uh, hopefully not a sales pitch. Uh, also, it's not a direct walkthrough and there is no live coding. Um, I found that the um, virtual platform here makes it difficult to share my screen and type the commands on the terminal and also be able to answer your questions at the same time. So I've decided to just um, show screenshots of the code and all the commands that I've been running. Uh, so to show you what was happening, but give you the opportunity to use the Q&A section um, as we go through it. Uh, this is a real world example, uh, something I've seen happen in the past. Um, so what I'm gonna do is sh explain the scenario, go through all the changes and show you all the screenshots, like I said. Uh, what I hope you can see that you can have serverless and have open source together. Uh, hopefully, be able to show you some new concepts. Uh, and then at the end, I'll give you some links to try some things out yourself if you're interested. Um, so a quick brief background on serverless, which um, I'm sure everyone's aware of now. But serverless really means that the server the code is running on no longer needs to be in consideration. Right? You don't have to log in somewhere and install packages or anything to that, of that nature. Uh, it starts when it's needed, runs for a very short time, disappears, there's no state sticking around and uh, it just executes code and gets out of the way. So AWS Lambda is really what introduced the concept to the general public back in 2014. Uh, it's, it has a ton of in integrations with other AWS services that makes it really easy to just plug in and, and use. So at AWS Lambda is cheap, it's easy, it's very popular, and it's really common. They advertise 20 cents for 1 million requests. Um, that, of course, price varies depending on uh, what you're doing with it, of course. Uh, it's super easy. They have uh, drop down menus in most of their other services that let you plug into your Lambda functions. Out of the people who responded that they use serverless in the CNCF survey last year, 53% said that they used Lambda. And since they pretty much introduced the idea most of the time when you speak about serverless, most people assume you're talking about AWS Lambda. It's almost synonymous with the word at this point. However, it is a product. Um, there are limits and it only works with AWS. It's cheap, 20 cents per million requests, but it still makes Amazon money at some level. Uh, this means that changes and upgrades are ultimately determined uh, by the revenue the potential at, at some level. Um, so the, the, they have limits, but they are pretty liberal, but they are decided by AWS uh, only. Uh, 15 minutes of a maximum runtime, three gigabytes of memory per function, and it only runs on AWS, or sorry, Amazon Limit, Linux uh, operating system. And also, since it relies on AWS to run, your local environment is never going to be an exact representation of what is in production. There are plenty of tools out there to simulate the environment, but it'll never be exactly the same. 
the LAMP CI Docker image is one great tool, and the SAM CLI that AWS owns uh, is another great tool for simulating the local environment. And then on the other side, um, OpenFast is open source. It's developer first, operator friendly, and it's very familiar and portable. So it's, it's MIT licensed, which means it's free for commercial use and free to um, fork it and make changes as you need. It's also part of the CNCF serverless landscape. Uh, it was first introduced back in 2016 as a Docker hack uh, pet project, and now it's got o almost two, 300 contributors, um, most of which are active or multi-commit um, contributors. Uh, it's very familiar. It uses a lot of the other CNCF projects as part of the stack. Uh, we call it the Plonk stack, which stands for Prometheus, uh, Linkerd, or you could substitute Linux with Containerd. Uh, OpenFAS, of course, NATS, and Kubernetes. And then we have a custom CLI that we uh, use to integrate with the functions. But it also works with the kube control or kube cuddle, however you prefer to pronounce it. It's also portable. Um, so we can deploy production containers with Docker Desktop, MicroKS, uh, Minikube, K3S, whatever uh, is comfortable for you in your local environment. And so the local environment is using the exact same technologies that uh, your production environment is using. On the other hand, it's not hosted. There's no definite SLAs, and it's a bunch of building blocks to come together as, as a whole. So you'll need to bring your own cluster, or uh, it also runs on a Linux VM with our somewhat recently released uh, FASD. It's very minimal impact. The OpenFast itself is, uh, you may not even notice it. It's such a small impact. Of course, depending on the loads of your functions, you might start to see some impact there. But although there is no support team, we have a really large uh, Slack community that's pretty active uh, at all times of the day. We have people from all over the world in all different time zones. Uh, so it's, somebody's almost always around. Uh, there is also commercial support via OpenFast Limited. Just throwing that out there. And if something does go wrong, it, it's not just one thing. It could be one of a few different things because of the stack nature, which is not uncommon um, for you know, software applications these days. So this is our scenario. It's a realistic situation. It could easily happen to any one of us. We're working on a startup that's about to get ready to launch. Right? The development team is focused on the product. Right? We want to make sure the thing that we're selling is, is ready and working as we expect it to. So while, we've, while we, the development team, focus on the product, the founder or owner or whomever uh, outsources a sign-up page for new customers to come in. The team that he contracted uh, sets up a web page, and it calls an AWS Lambda function that stores the customer sign-up information and stores it into a DynamoDB that we can use, that the sales team can use later to contact these customers. So great news, shortly after launch, everything's really successful. Um, we get a lot of funding, they hire a CTO, but his, uh, their opinion is that all of the development should be managed by the company. So the existing product that we've been working on uh, is running in Kubernetes cluster hosted by DigitalOcean. Uh, and that's where um, the product is living. And so the CTO wants the customer sign-up page that you see here to also be a part of that product stack. Oops, sorry. Um, so we, we need, need to be able to move the, the AWS Lambda and the sign-up page into the um, Kubernetes cluster possibly on DigitalOcean. The CTO is also in talks with Google Cloud and Azure, possibility for a large, uh, larger clusters and increased load and all that stuff. So we want to be able to bring everything together into one, one form. Sorry, uh, just catching up on the questions that have been coming in. Uh, so this is our 
the AWS Lambda function that was created and is out there running right now that is handling our signup page. Um, if you're not familiar with the platform, you are able to resize the windows, the slides windows, if you can't read that code exactly. Um, although it's not uh, that important. It's a fairly standard Lambda function, right? We receive a, the event from the API gateway via post request, read the data from the body, maybe do some validation, make sure they have a legitimate email address. And then we save the data to a DynamoDB table. And if you're not familiar, DynamoDB is AWS's NoSQL database as a service, and it implements a lot of the MongoDB API, which is really nice as a hosted database solution. So if we take a step back real quick and look at the bare bones hello world examples from, from AWS Lambda. So this is the function that is created when, when you create a new Lambda function with no other input. Um, just click through the, the web UI and, and it gives you this. Uh, it gives you an event object as a parameter. Then uh, you create a response object with the status and the body, and then you return that object. And that's it. I mean, it's, it's really straightforward, very simple. Uh, similarly, OpenFAS, we created a brand new function using the Node.js uh, version 12 template that we have. Uh, and again, it takes an event parameter, but we also have a context object that comes in. And I'll show you what both of those include here in just a few minutes. So then we return the context uh, directly, and we chain on the status code and also indicate a successful response and include the body of the response we want to send back to the caller. All right, so now we have to install OpenFAS. And again, we're assuming that there is a Kubernetes cluster already available to us that we have access to or, or the operations team perhaps has access to. And so what we're gonna do is, is the official OpenFAS installer called Arcade. It's another open source project that's on GitHub you can search for. Uh, it's basically a package installer for Kubernetes and it executes upstream Helm charts with CLI flags rather than values YAML files that you might be familiar with. So if you see at the top, and again, you can resize the window, hopefully you'd be able to read, read this better. So at the top, we're running the install command for OpenFAS and we're gonna pass the load balancer flag because we're gonna deploy this into a uh, cloud cluster. And then you can see it's found the cube control file, or sorry, cube config file on my system. And it's, and it's found that uh, Helm 3 is installed. And then about halfway down, uh, you can see when the, the orange or yellow colors start to show up. That's the actual um, Helm command that's being executed for us by Arcade with all of the flags set to a um, some same defaults that were decided in the arcade package. And of course you can change some of those with the flags on the command line. Uh, and then at the end, you'll see the kube control command as shown and that you can run, you can copy and run to verify that the open fast has been installed. Uh, there's also a lot more helpful information that I've trimmed off just to make this picture fit into the slide. The whole process took a, about a minute or so, but it could be longer um, if it has to, download Helm for you or download Cube Control if they're not already installed on the system that you're running this on. So now we need to install the OpenFast CLI, uh, excuse me, on our local system in order to manage the, the functions easier. Uh, then you'll see at the bottom, after we've installed it, we try to run a command and it automatically tries to connect to a local instance. Um, so by default, everything is ready to run locally. So if we go back and run one of those commands that were from the arcade output, we can see the deployed pods at the top. Um, and then at the, in the bottom section there, another, we'll run another one of those arcade commands to get the external IP address of our load balancer. So then after we get that public IP address, we'll set that to an environment variable so that the fast CLI knows where to connect. And then we'll use that um, going forward so we don't have to pass that in for every command. Then we're gonna get the login credentials from the Kubernetes secrets. So the arcade inst installation generated a random 
uh, password for us to use. And then we can pull that out of the Kubernetes secrets and again, pass that into um, a variable and for, forward that into the login command. And so at the bottom there, you see now we're connected to the local, or sorry, the remote cluster, and there are no functions yet, but we're getting there. So if we go back real quick to the, the pods that were deployed, you can see the Planck stack um, as it is deployed. So we have Prometheus and Alert Manager, and those two are responsible for the, the metrics and scaling of the functions. Then we have the NATS, QWorker, and FAS Idler for scale to zero, the queuing system, and the asynchronous invocation of the functions. Uh, and then finally, we have the gateway and the ba basic auth for accessing the functions. And again, um, since this is not a live coding session and we're just going through the commands that were executed, please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A section and I'll do my best to, to catch them as they come in and try to answer them as we go through. Uh, if you do have any questions on what's being run or, or what's being shown. So now we've got OpenFast installed. We've got, or sorry, the, the OpenFast CLI installed. We've got OpenFast installed on our cluster. So now let's create a new function uh, that's going to replace our existing Lambda. So using the fast CLI, we're going to use the new command. We'll give it a name. We'll call it sign up. And we'll tell it what language to use. In this case, node version 12. Uh, there are several available. I'll, I'll get back to that in a few minutes. And then I'm passing in the prefix flag with my username. Uh, with my username to prefix the image that is created so I can push it into Docker Hub later. Uh, so then if we change the directory into the, the named uh, directory of the function, we list the files that are there and we have a handler.js and a package.json. So it looks very similar to a bare bones basic Node.js application. And since we're migrating this AWS Lambda function, uh, which is which is still connected to DynamoDB, we're going to need AWS SDK. So here in this directory, we can just run npm install and just like normal and get that, that dependency installed. And behind the scenes, the, the Node 12 template uses Express.js as uh, the application routing. Although you don't need to concern be concerned with that inside the function, it is, there are, some um, features available because we're using Express um, behind the scenes. So while we're moving and using all of and migrating the code over, we're going to need to make sure that everything is working um, as we go through the, the migration process. So we're going to use the fast CLI and we're going to build the function into a container image. And so we run the fast build and it takes the function code that is in the handlers.js file and the package.json and bundle it with the template code that includes Express, as I mentioned. And it'll bring those two things together. And as you can see, um, about a quarter of the way down, step one of 29, it, we're pulling in the OpenFast watchdog, which allows the functions to be invoked through events. And then at the end, it'll spit out a um, Docker image that's ready to run, ready to build, or sorry, yeah, ready to run as a container. Uh, I also wanted to point out right there in the in the middle that unit tests, if they are, if they do exist with your function, they will get executed as part of the build. So it's um, it'll protect you from any mistakes that you may have made um, while you're working in it. Uh, that's not available on all of the templates, but uh, it is a nice feature for a lot of them. Uh, and then at the very end, you see that the image is built with my username as a prefix and the sign up as the name. So now we can actually use Docker to run the container that was built. Uh, no other dependencies, it's just the image that was built. We're gonna run it and we'll use, we'll use the um, port forwarding to uh, be able to invoke this locally. And so, 
in this example, what I've done is just simply console.log the context and the event that the function receives. And I was using the Insomnia API client to invoke this, uh, just so you can see the, um, the host and, and things like that. And so you'll see in the event, we have the body, headers, method, query, request path. Uh, you'll make note that the body is an actual JSON object, not a string as uh, AWS likes to do. It's very similar though in structure to the AWS Lambda event that comes in. Uh, the context on the other hand, is an object that gets that will get serialized into a response by the template code. And you can see you have access to the headers and status code separately. And the CB or the callback uh, is what will serialize the object for you uh, to return as the body. All right, so now that we have the function running, as you can see, everything's ready to go. Let's see what the difference was, what actually changed. If we made all of these changes in place in a git repository, this is what the git diff would look like. So led lambda is on the left, openfast is on the right. You can see at the top, we're gonna to require the FS library to access the file system uh, to get the AWS secrets. Uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. And so we're gonna to have to add a new function called configure AWS and then set the Dynamo DB variable. And again, I'll show you that in just a few minutes. Uh, and so the event body, oh, sorry, um, we no longer need to create the default response object since it's now being handled by the context directly. So we don't just have this object um, getting modified as we go through the code. Uh, the event body then needs to be checked for the keys since it's not a string anymore. We need to see that the, if, make sure that there was a body included in the request, it just as a safety measure. And then you can see on lines 14 and 15 on the right hand side, the status code is being passed to the context, and then we are calling the fail extension, right? So that is that will automatically log errors, and by default, return a status code of 500 if you don't specify anything. So we could have just said context.fail and be done with it. It would have returned empty with a 500 to let the um, user know that this has not worked without having to pass anything additional inside. So if we scroll down a little bit further, the main parts of the function remain for the most part intact. The changes here, just replacing the modification of the response object that was created at the beginning from Lambda and changing that to calling extensions on the OpenFast context. So then at the top on line 19, you see that we no longer need to have the JSON parse function as the body is already a JSON object. So we can skip that potential for failure right there. Um, and then this feels a little bit more natural for a node developer, I think, uh, to call extensions rather than setting a property and passing an object to a callback directly. Now we're just using the framework that's uh, given to us. And then finally, this is that, um, that new function that we were talking about earlier, the configure AWS. So since we're not running within the Lambda environment anymore, we need to be able to provide the AWS SDK with the credentials in order to access the DynamoDB and various other features that maybe the function is using. Uh, so Lambda handles all of this automatically. When you create a new function, you a Lambda function, you select a drop down to select your IAM permissions and all of that. And so on contrary, so now we're running in OpenFAS, which does not have that set. So what we're gonna use is native Kubernetes secrets. And I'll show you that in just a moment. But by default, the secrets are stored in the slash var slash OpenFAS slash secrets, and then the name of the secret. So that's why we needed the FS library earlier. So now we can access those functions or those secrets. And then we're setting the AWS config and you passing those secrets in so that it can then access DynamoDB with the same permissions that the Lambda had. But I would argue a little more secure since we're using Kubernetes secrets that are um, well tested and secure. Um, then finally, in the signup page, we'll just change the URL from calling the Lambda function on the left to the OpenFAS URL and function path on the right with our new uh, function name. So before we deploy the function, we need to make sure those secrets exist. And so we can use the fast CLI to do this with fast secret create, give it a name and pass in the values. 
Uh, alternatively, if you're more comfortable with cube control, cube control, uh, we can we can create the secrets just the same in this in the um, yeah in the same fashion as the fast CLI. Just trying to make things easy, and then so now we're able to. Uh, publish the container image, and in this case, we're going to publish to Docker Hub, but you could also pass a registry URL for custom or private uh, registries for your images. So now we go to deploy the function, and again, using the fast CLI to deploy, you, you'll see it's failed at the bottom there. And so I wanted to show this real quick. It's a small, but I think important feature. So the fast CLI will not deploy a function when it requires secrets that aren't yet available in the cluster being deployed. So it's just a little safety net just to make sure you're not um, missing something or possibly attempting to deploy a function in the wrong place. So if we go back and change that unknown secret name to the proper proper name, we do the deploy again, and you see we got a 202 accepted, and we have the URL with the path to actually invoke that uh, function directly. So now that the function is actually out there and deployed, um, we might want to see what's happening, make sure it's working the way it's supposed to. So to view the logs of the function, we can again use the fast CLI logs and then the name of the function. And also, again, if you're more comfortable with cube control, it's, uh, we can use that just as well. And if you remember uh, earlier, the logs when we were running locally look exactly the same. Uh, just to show that everything is working exactly as it was on your local environment, as is the deployed or production environment. And now that our function is deployed, our website is updated to the plan. Or, um, yeah, our web page is updated to the fast URL. But that's ugly, right? It's an IP address. Um, we could fix that by deploying a reverse proxy somewhere, set up DNS, give it a proper domain, all of that other things that are sort of uh, traditional for web application. Or we can use the open fast ingress operator. So this will create ingress records for you. It'll create certificates with cert manager and let's encrypt um, certificates. Supports several different ingress options for your cluster and also works on ARM and uh, Raspberry Pi. So again, we'll use the Arcade installer and first we'll install the ingress nginx. And then again, you'll see the helm command there. Then we'll install the cert manager separately. And again, the Helm command that is being run is shown for verification. Now we install the OpenFast ingress operator. Um, if you can see at the top, we pass in the registration email and the domain as flags, which is the nice feature of Arcade. Uh, it does a check to make sure our, our cluster is prepared with Nginx and Cert Manager. And then when it finishes, you'll see a handful of commands to give you and some notes about what they're for include checking the certificate status, getting the ingress, certificate logs, and all of that. All right, so that was successful. And now that we have a proper domain, we can update our FastCLI credentials and associate the login with the actual domain address. And then we can see if we do a list, we have our function that we deployed earlier to sign up. So one more quick update to the website and change the IP address to the nice domain URL for the gateway. So the gateway URL changed, but we still have that path to the function. So it's uh, gateway slash function slash function name. Uh, but if you remember, the CTO said that they would like to have all of the services together. Uh, but at this point, the startup, the site is still being hosted as an AWS S3 static site, which is nice, don't get me wrong, but the CTO wanted everything together. And we can do that. Since OpenFast functions are nothing more than a container, why not have Nginx and static assets as a function? There's an existing uh, custom template from Alex Ellis, the creator of the OpenFast, that is just that. It's still early. Um, it exists as mostly a proof of work, uh, work in progress. But you can download this. You can use the Fast CLI, download this template, or any custom template. Uh, as a matter of fact, and and then create a new function from that template. So you see at the bottom there, fast new sign up site, and the language is the static site nginx. And again, passing my username prefix, and we have created the um, 
the function code. So now, first thing we do is copy the existing sites bundled and minified code in the dist directory into the new functions directory. And then we do the fast build. And, the, and then we can run it again, uh, just as we did before with the Docker run and passing in the uh, port so we can access it from outside. And then you see the logs is just Nginx and it's providing our static assets. So now we have a, a function that is our static site, which is really nice, but we still have the same path as the sign up function, which is the gateway URL slash function slash function name. And that's no good to hand to customers uh, as a website. So we introduce function ingress, which is ingress per function. So you can directly access a function um, through an ingress. Now this is still in an, an, an incubator status. So you'll need to clone that incubator repository for the ingress operator and then run cube control to apply those artifacts. And then you'll see in the logs, it'll set up the ingress and at the bottom uh, gives you a TLS route uh, by default to access your function that you've provided. So this is the uh, function ingress YAML file that was applied in that previous slide. And so we're going to define the custom resource with a domain name and then the name of the function to route to. And finally, the certificate issuer to use. In this case, um, let's encrypt prod. And so now our site has a, pretty, a nice domain name to access. The site is hosted in our cluster. So it's part of the rest of the project and applications. And you'll see we have a, a little lock in the address bar to indicate the certificate is has been verified. And if we use cube control to get the pods in the OpenFAS FN or function namespace, you can see both the previous Lambda function and the new static site are there. So great, everything's deployed, now what? So people familiar with Kubernetes operations will feel comfortable with OpenFAS. Developers, new hires will feel right at home as well. Operators can continue to use cube control if they're familiar with that to manage the functions and ingress with CRDs and pods and various. Um, Prometheus, since Prometheus is part of the stack, we have metrics and monitoring and they're included. So SREs are gonna love you. Uh, it is Kubernetes native, so we have containers, uh, CRDs, as I mentioned, we're using ingress operators. And for developers, they can be productive almost right away as the result are just standard containers. Uh, there, there are community-driven function stores, stores for functions and templates, uh, but you could also build your own company's private template store uh, or function store to, to make it easy and you can do a fast new with the language of your company sign up as a template. Uh, then the final step of this whole scenario to, to move everything into an open source and, a, and a out of AWS entirely, if that was your direction, would be to migrate the data to a MongoDB instance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, DynamoDB handles a lot of the same um, APIs as MongoDB, so it would be a pretty straightforward operation. But it goes a little beyond what I was trying to show here with the migration to OpenFAS. Uh, but if you did do that, you could then go back to your OpenFAS function, uninstall the AWS SDK, remove those AWS secrets from the cluster, and then switch to using MongoJS or, or something similar to access this new data store. Uh, the AWS then at that point could be closed. Uh, the entire solution could then easily be moved between Kubernetes clusters uh, with the simple arcade to install OpenFAS and FastCLI to deploy those functions into the new cluster. Uh, it'd be almost no effort to move to uh, either Azure or Google uh, hosted Kubernetes as the CTO had mentioned earlier in our, in our scenario. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed going through this effort. You realize it's not as big of a challenge as it may sound at the beginning. Uh, so we have a fully open source serverless solution. Uh, then if you'd like to learn a little bit more about OpenFast, the official workshop is maintained by the, by the team. Uh, it'll demonstrate all of the features of OpenFast and it will, run, it will run entirely on your system using uh, Docker Desktop, Docker for Mac, um, Micro K8S, whatever um, suits your fancy 
for local Kubernetes. Uh, we also have a large Slack community. So you could join the, the community, introduce yourself, let them know that you saw this presentation here. Um, and everyone's always happy to answer questions, give you help if you get stuck, encounter some sort of errors, uh, and also introduce some new ideas and, and projects as they come along. And finally, um, as was mentioned in yesterday's keynote, uh, this is another one of those open source projects that is completely independently funded. Uh, we're not, it's not built by a large, large corporation, it's just a, a bunch of volunteers working on their free time to make this a solution that, that works well for everybody. So we do appreciate your support and uh, it'll keep the project moving forward and adding new features as they come along. Uh, so if there are any questions, the, the Q&A section to the left of the screen, um, I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, somebody says, other than FAS and open FAS, what are good Google search phrases to learn more about this? Um, I think the the word serverless is is good, although it is it is um, an actual company and a project that that uses uh, AWS Lambda, uh, so you might get conflated answers with that actual um, company. I think it's a company or a project. Uh, but FAS is, is a well-known term for function as, functions as a service, and OpenFAS, of course, is the OpenFAS project, uh, so that would be a, definitely a good search term. Uh, somebody says, what does OpenFAS do anything to solve the cold start problem? Uh, so by default, all of the functions are are always at the ready and sitting idle. Um, and you can set that, and that's also, that's a configuration that you can change. Uh, so you can have a minimum um, replicas of one. So your functions are always uh, warm, they call it. Uh, alternatively, uh, the the templates that are used and the languages and all of that other stuff are, are highly tuned to make sure that that cold start is as low as possible. Uh, of course, it won't be zero unless you keep one around, but it's an idle container, so you likely wouldn't notice much of a difference, but uh, we do make a lot of work towards keeping that cold start time as low as possible. Uh, some of the other languages like Java, for example, is one that we, we spent quite a bit of time uh, struggling with because of the, the JVM start time. Uh, but I think we've got that with a few other libraries to a, a very, um, reasonable amount. Uh, and then someone else says, as a complete beginner, I need to learn a variety of stack layers before I can even start to learn OpenFAS. I assume I should study VirtualBox, Docker, and Kubernetes. What else and in what order? Um, I don't think that's necessary. You don't necessarily need to understand all of the layers uh, per se to get started. Uh, of course, that, lang that that understanding will come as you use it more and more often. Uh, and then you can sort of, uh, as they say, dip your toes into these new um, concepts. But to get started, um, if you're running Windows or Mac, there's Docker Desktop. And then um, Ubuntu has Micro K8S. Uh, there's also K3S and um, Kind, which is Kubernetes and Docker. So all of these things are, are great tools to just get you started with a Kubernetes cluster. And then using the Arcade installer, you can easily install OpenFAS onto that cluster with um, almost no work on your part. And then you can get started on that in that workshop and step through and grow your understanding of all of the features in OpenFAS. And so what, what OpenFAS is, is, is trying, and as it was mentioned earlier, the, as developer friendly. Right, we're trying to make it easy to deploy workloads into Kubernetes. Um, it can be as small as a function or as large as a full API if you need. Uh, as you saw in the log output from earlier, uh, you can you can access a function and with a path and everything else inside the function, so it could actually be as big as um, a, a full API as a function that would that would include the auto scaling and things. And someone says, do pods spin? up per function or are there pods waiting to do work? 
Um, so there are, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but um, projects that scale Kubernetes automatically and add nodes and remove nodes uh, through, um, sorry, I can't think of the term right now, but all of the, most of the uh, hosted Kubernetes clusters also include some sort of scaling operation where you can automatically scale your cluster. Uh, OpenFAS itself does not do that. It, it scales out the functions. So if, um, depending on how you set it up and, and what configuration options you use, uh, the function will uh, scale when there's so many requests per second, and it will just add another replica of that function to be able to distribute the load uh, between the two. And then your Kubernetes cluster behind the scenes could scale out and add pods as it as it becomes necessary. Then OpenFast will, will be aware of those new pods and deploy those functions to those new pods. And then, um, again, when the load goes down, the, the functions will scale back. And then behind the scenes, again, Kubernetes cluster will uh, scale back to those newly added pods. Again, depending on how you have it set up. So how's your how is your function accessing DynamoDB when that exists only on AWS? Is this some kind of hybrid cloud local data center implementation? That's a good question. Um, let me see if I can quickly go back to that slide. Real quick. Um, so because of, because we have included the AWS SDK in our function and we are passing the credentials here to the um, AWS SDK.config. And so we're updating that configuration with the, of the SDK with the region and the credentials. And then so the URL, or sorry, the, the DynamoDB um, accesses that region uh, with those credentials, and it uses then IAM to to uh, connect to the database and and connect to it. So it's just um, because we're using AWS SDK and those credentials, um, it it works that way through over the public internet. So this is actually deployed on DigitalOcean, and it's accessing the DynamoDB instance in AWS. It's a good question though. Uh, I see that it is more lightweight than Knative. Could you compare a bit between OpenFast and Knative? Um, so the Knative and OpenFast are very, very similar. They follow the same sort of paradigm of a function as a container, uh, which makes it really easy to distribute across the play, uh, across um, implementations. So Knative is, is a really great open source serverless project that came out of Google. And um, so there's a lot of similarities. Uh, there's a lot of differences. Um, as you mentioned, um, this is a lot more lightweight than Knative. Uh, if you if you absolutely need all of the um, hands-on and knobs and buttons to twist, um, Knative might be more your more the way to go. But as as I understand it personally, Knative was built to provide a platform for other projects to build on top of. Uh, to to um, obfuscate that that complexity that is Knative, uh, whereas OpenFast is built on top of Kubernetes uh, directly, and it's built with the developer and the operator in mind. So uh, we we intentionally leave out some things, but uh, try to make it as easy as possible to get started and get using it. And it's it's absolutely not lacking any features, uh, but some things we decide are too complex and don't really fit in the OpenFast model. Uh, so what is your favorite thing about OpenFast? Nice. Uh, so I got uh, running out of time, but I got started in the project because I was really curious of serverless. Uh, and I didn't want to set up an account with AWS and possibly run my credit card into the ground uh, from, from spending too much money. So I went on a search for how to do uh, serverless um, locally, and I found OpenFast. And I really came to love it because um, it's all open source. It all runs on my laptop if I want it to, and I can deploy it into um, a production environment and still have all of the great features of Kubernetes built in uh, and still be able to play around with it locally. Uh, so that looks like our time is up. 
and I think I've answered all of the questions that came in. And if not, I will be available on the Slack channel uh, to cloud app. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all there. So thank you.